if you really care about the Ukrainian people like you claim you do, then listen to me very carefully. My name is Lucas Gage. I served two tours in Iraq. I put it in quotes because who did I serve? The special interest who wanted war. How did they get that war? They lied to us. They said Saddam had weapons of mass destruction and he was tied to 9-11. Both lies and we all know it now. Years later, of course, after all the damage has been done. The same, I believe, is happening with the Ukrainians. Lucas, well, um, quite a passionate voice. I think <laughs> in our little conversation before I started this, I said that you're an Italian and I can hear that Italian passion. Tell us about um, tell us about this video. Yeah, so the video that you're referring to is the uh, video that went viral. It was actually on Twitter. And so I it went viral on Twitter because a friend of mine, she's a, a very much a geopolitical figure, has 200,000 followers. And I said to her, you know, I haven't made a video like this in a very long time. And if I do this, it's going to suck me back into this geopolitical sphere, which I pretty much retired from. So I thought, I said, mm -hmm. but I told my wife a few days, I said, you know, I got to say something because we're at the brick of World War III. So I made this video. I asked my friend to look at it. She goes, this is excellent. We're going to make it go viral. So she tweeted it out and it went viral. Everyone picked up on it, retweeted it thousands of times, likes everyone. And then someone took it. Then someone took the video and said, "Hey, Lucas, can I put this on TikTok?" I said, "Go ahead." So this person put on a TikTok, got another three hundred fifty thousand views, and then all these people picked it up, and now they're asking me for interviews and everything like that. And so it was a good thing to say because I'm I'm talking about practical peace talks. You know, let's let's stop the propaganda that Ukraine can win this thing on their own, and you know, feeding these people this delusion, and let's just sit down and have the talks for peace because you know we can't risk World War Three for this. No matter what, how you look at it, whether it's a land grab or it's unfair, however people want to make the narrative, we shouldn't risk World War III and possible nuclear war for this conflict. I mean, it just nobody wants it. I mean, you, Europe doesn't want it. If they really wanted to, uh, if they really thought Putin was taking all of Europe, they would have declared war immediately, you know, all of them. But, you know, this is clearly uh, the Ukrainians are being used. So I'm appealing to the Ukrainians saying, look, you're being used as a bulwark against Russia. They don't care about you. The United States, EU, NATO, they don't care about you at all. They're using you. And you guys have to look at this and say, wow, this is actually the case. And I was trying to talk sense to them and, and you know, in a peaceful manner between both sides that we should sit down and talk. And we know Russia has been saying, look, we'll sit down and talk to you at any time, despite what the Ukrainians keep on doing. Putin is saying, let's have talk peace talks. But Zelensky refuses. And he's been, I think he's being t told to refuse, by the way. I don't think he's in charge at all. So, you know, my video goes off into not that much detail, but just to say, look, we got to push for peace, not war. And people resonate with that. So that's what they need to hear right now, because nobody wants this war. No, not, no one I know personally wants it. You know, none of my friends and family. It just seems to be this mainstream media wants it. You know, even Democrats want it. For, they're supposed to be the anti-war party, and they're the ones pushing it even more. So it's like, what's going on? So it's yeah. very interesting. And uh, that's why I made the video. And, and you know, my friend knew because she knows my voice. She knows I've made videos before that that passion would really resonate with people. And that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think the question I want to ask you is obviously the video is a kind of a call for peace. That's really the kind of kind of heart of it all. But you also bring um, you kind of explain as well what I will call the other side of the narrative or the other side of the story that we're not getting to hear right. when we read Western mainstream media. I read the American papers as well. So I have a pretty good good idea of what the American people are subjected to in terms of the messaging around this war. What is your take on the war? What, it's, 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 as I said, it's more than just a, a, a call for peace. It's also explaining to people the kind of run up to this war, the background to this war, the history to this war. Will you explain to us what that would be? Yeah, so most Americans, they're getting the narrative that Putin just invaded. Just that's that's where it begins with the mainstream media. He invaded, unprovoked, 
invasion. No, no, no. What are you talking about? 2014, we threw a coup in that area and we ousted a pro-Russian president, installed a puppet, caused problems there. there. There's ethnic cleansing in the region for eight years. So Russians were, they were being told you can't speak Russian. They were being shelled. They were being killed. And Putin endured this whole time. And there was all these agreements that were being broken. So there's a whole other narrative that the West is not showing the people. So they yeah, just think. Can, this... can I just interrupt you right now? You, sure. You said these, uh, uh, the, the, all the promises that were broken. I'd like you to illuminate that. Give me, give me. The, let's talk about from your point of view, uh, and that's not the narrative that we get get to here. What is what is the run of the background to this in real terms as you see it? And let's well, talk about those broken promises. Well, look, Putin doesn't want NATO to take, uh, doesn't want Ukraine to become part of NATO. It's an ex existential threat to Russia, right? So the promise is, look, uh, you you don't become part of this organization, stay neutral, and don't become a, a proxy of the West, obviously. And that's exactly what the Ukrainians were doing, you know, despite the things that they're supposed to be at peace. But now you're, they like I said earlier, they were attacking the Russian-speaking people in the regions, in the Donbas regions, they even had laws against speaking Russia. It's, it's basically ethnic cleansing. So whatever agreements they had, Minsk agreements, you know, here all these things that they're supposed to abide to. How can it be? How could you say that it's okay for you to kill the people there and uphold an agreement? So obviously, Putin's seeing these people are breaking their promises. They're supposed to provide safety in that region, peace, and be neutral. They cannot be seen as neutral if they're attacking the Russian people in that area. Mm -hmm. And therefore, Putin's like, what's going on here in this situation? So, uh, again, also, when it comes to preventing this, what could have been prevented is if the Ukrainians kept their the, the promises. They're always going to say Russia broke their promises, right? They broke the agreement first. Yeah. But the thing is, we see NATO expanding toward the east anyway. We, we, we see it happening. If you look at the map of NATO expanding, when the Soviet Union was there, you could say there was a reason for it. But it's yeah. all Russia is no longer the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And Putin has not said anything about expanding and taking all of Europe and anything like this. So we, when we see these people have these narratives about, you know, Putin's going to take all of Ukraine, which makes no sense because, as I said, he wants a buffer state between NATO and Russia. If he takes all of Ukraine, there's no buffer state. And Russia's right there next to NATO. It's like doing the work for them. That makes no sense. A little bit of logic there. <laughs> right. So that narrative, no one here, oh, he's going to take all of Ukraine. And we also see that, on one hand, Putin sucks. His military runs out of missiles. He can't do anything. He's losing. On the other hand, he's going to take over all of Europe. Now, if the Europeans truly believe that, yeah, they would have declared war. There wouldn't have been a proxy war. It would have been like, all right, all of NATO invade Russia. But here's the thing. Russia has nuclear weapons, so that's not going to happen. So they have to do this proxy war, hoping to weaken Russia. And in like my video, if you really care about the Ukrainians, you don't want them to be used as this cannon fodder because they don't care about the Ukrainians. That's what the Ukrainians don't understand. Yeah. I've had some arguments today with some Ukrainians. Well, not arguments, but like conversation. I said, don't you see what they're doing? America uses people. They're using you. They don't care about you. Yeah. They don't care if you get destroyed or not. So Going back to these agreements, which were clearly broken by the Ukrainians, well, what is Russia supposed to do? Putin has been very, very patient for all these years, despite what was going on. Right? There is fighting in the region, of course. The separatists and the, and the loyalists, that happens. The civil war in the region. When we had the coup, there was, there was I think, CIA assassinating you know, snipers and all this crazy stuff. So Putin sees the West has a hand in this. So what's the next move? The next move is to install a puppet that's anti-Russia. He cannot tolerate. So whether Ukrainians are officially part of NATO or not is irrelevant. He sees a hostile government there. So whatever agreements they had don't matter. They're, the West has broken the agreements, whether it's Ukrainians doing or the NATO doing it. So he sees that. He's not a moron. Putin's very intelligent. Yeah. So yeah. He, he sees what's going on. He says, oh, this is a threat to my country. And they're killing these people in the regions. We're going to have a military operation limited in nature to free these people, to denazify the region. He did exactly that. He had the referendum. They said, we want to go to Russia, and they went to Russia. And that's all. And so the Ukrainians know when we're going to fight, you're going to get rid we're getting all the regions black, plus Crimea, and we're going to get rid of Putin. I mean, are these people delusional? <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. 
Well, let, let me let me ask you this question. You you read the papers, obviously. You follow the news in the USA. You talk to your friends. You talk to I assume still a lot of people that are in the military as well. My question question and what I'm sort of trying to wrap my my brain around is. You've just men mentioned breaking agreements. You've made a reference really to the Minsk agreement as well yeah. in, in what you just said now. are When you talk to your friends about this, uh, people in the military about this, are people aware of these facts, aware of the fact that there were in fact agreements that NATO would not expand, at least if not agreements, at least a promise that NATO would not expand I think the reference once was uh, one inch uh, east to the Elba River. Are the American audiences informed about things like the Minsk Agreement? Are they informed about the 2014 what Putin calls coup d'etat that took place? Is that, is that being talked about or is it is it just you calling it? No, I don't think people know about these things. The, the, what I do see are the people in the region know about them. They'll say, no, it wasn't a coup. It was, he was elected and it was, everything was fine. You're calling it a coup because you're a Putin shill. So there's always going to be those debates between the people in the region. But most Americans, like I said, they're getting the narrative Putin invaded because he's expanding and he wants to take over everyone. But that's, that's what they're getting. They don't know anything about any agreements. They don't understand the history of the region. I'm not an expert either in the region myself, but logically I could see what's developing. Mm -hmm. You know, My experience with Iraq, once I realized my government lied to me about Iraq, and I started seeing what they did to Syria, because this is back then when I was doing activism as well against the Syrian, pro the propaganda against Syria. You know, the red line there was the chemical weapons. Oh, I saw it. I better not use chemical weapons. And then what happens? Mm -hmm. There's an attack, which wasn't the terrorists who used the weapons all the time. It wasn't those crazy Al Nusra Front, Al Qaeda, ISIS affiliated people who kill children on video, eat their heart. It wasn't them. It was Assad who was winning. He just had to gas somebody. He was itching to kill his own people with chlorine gas, not the terrorists who were doing it 55 of their times. The same narrative here. Oh, there better not be a nuclear a dirty bomb. There better not be this. There better, there's always these red lines that somehow get crossed in Russia. For example, like the Nord 2 pipeline. I mean, that's obviously wasn't Russia, but the narrative, oh, the Russians did it. So that's the same scripts that they use is they, they do something and they blame the Russians for it, or they blame the Syrians or the Iraqis or whoever else they want to blame. Dirty bomb, same thing. Right, right, which yeah. is ridiculous. Dirty yeah. bomb. I mean, they have, Russia has functional nuclear weapons. If they want to use a nuclear, they'll just use a nuclear weapon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Let me, let me ask you uh, uh, this, uh, just, just uh, you, because you are sitting in the USA and, and I, I'm based here in Europe, and we, we're basically getting the same information. I think I get yeah. this, a lot of the same information that you're getting. But let's talk about that pipeline, for example. I mean, if you sit with your mates and you have a beer or you have a drink or whatever the case might be, I mean, isn't there kind of a private admission amongst the Americans like, well, you know, I mean, you know, there's got to be some American hands in all of, of this. Is that yeah. something we don't, just don't talk about? It's just kind of... Uh, it's as ridiculous as Epstein killing himself. That, that's the joke. We all yeah. know it was the United States or the British or someone in the area. Again, how did the Russians get in that area? How did well, they we get sure there? As, we sure as hell would be reasonable to conclude that Putin yeah. would not blow up his own pipeline. Right. That 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 is leverage for yeah. Europe. Hey, listen, uh, Germany, you need help. Why don't you? No. Nope. Now that that has been taken out. And by the way, Biden said he would take care of it. Did he not? He said, oh, we'll take it. Well, don't worry. We'll take care yeah. of it. And then it happens. Then we have this text message from uh, Truss, whatever her name is, who, who, who we already stepped down. It's done. What is she talking about? It's done. You know, well, obviously the pipeline has been destroyed. So we could definitely uh, assume it was at least MI6 or something, which, by the way, helped the Ukrainians hit the bridge in Crimea. So it's not just the Ukrainians. And when, when, so when the Russians say we're fighting the collective West, they are. You know, we have airborne people there now. You know, we have uh, 101 airborne. We have Ital even Italians were there, some contractors. And I'm sitting there like, why is Italians there? Uh, Polish there. We have uh, also even Al Qaeda is there. We have we have people from Syria, our assets being relocated into uh, the, the fighting, uh, the, the war zone, being captured by the Russians on tape, being said, hey, you know, we're getting paid $1,200. We're getting, we're getting paid $1,500 by France or whatever. 
It's like, wow, this is a very dirty war. It's a very dirty proxy war. So, But who's hearing this? Who's going to tell this to the American people? You have to do your research. You have to go and look at different websites from different countries because you're not going to hear it from CNN. You know, maybe Fox will say something, but they have their limited in their scope too. So you have to do your research on your own. And most Americans, they don't, like I said, they, they have so much war fatigue. They don't even care about it, they, but they are sick of paying for everything. Yeah. So so a lot of them are against the war because they don't want to pay anymore. Like, why is our tax dollars billions and billions going here? 50 billion, they're there. We can't even pay for health care. We can't pay for anything. We're losing this infrastructure. That's why the Americans are sick. It's not like they care about the, the land disputes between you know, Russia or Ukraine or whatever history is there. Mm. They don't care about it at all. They, they care about it financially, economically, the, the effects. I mean, look, I tell the Ukrainian people who are listening, if they have any sense, how long do you think the Europeans are going to deal with this winter coming up or the next winter? Are they going to freeze to death for you? I mean, at some point, and, and, and Zelensky arrogantly, we need more money, send it quicker. We need more weapons. This can't last forever. It just can't. No one can afford it. So they're not going to win just for that reason. They can't win on the ground face to face. Plus they can't win. So it's just not a winnable situation. For, could, could, could Ukraine become a Vietnam for Russia? Sure. Of course. I mean, look, the Ukrainians can fight, but who is going to supply them all these things for it's that's the problem. So unless it was infinite money, infinite weapons for decades, that would be different. But I already see the war fatigue in France People want to get out of NATO. They're get us out of NATO. Italy, there was a huge thing. Get us out of here. We want no more arms to Ukraine. So they're, the Europeans are, are not unified behind Ukraine as people make it seem like they are. And that's why they need this propaganda that they're saying about Putin killing everything, slaughtering children, all this crazy stuff. And look, war is ugly. Of course, there's going to be civilian casualties on both ends. But they're making it seem like the Russians are doing all these war crimes and all this. Come on, this the Azov Battalion who said we're going to kill every single collaborator we run into, openly stating it. And then we come to Bukha. There's all these dead people who were friendly with the Russians, and then when the Russians left, they're all dead. Yeah. What happened there? Yeah. Oh no, you can't. You can't deny that. That's a, you're denying the Bukha massacre. Well, look at the time frames. Mm -hmm. They they saw the massacre at, at the April fourth or whatever. Russia was already gone. So who killed these people? You said nothing when you got there. When it was liberated, you said nothing about these people being dead. And then suddenly they're all dead. So very interesting there. But yeah. you look at the New York Times, you look at all these, oh, the Russians, here's why they did. Here's this recording about someone talking about shooting someone on a bike. Who's that person talking? There's no confirmation that's legitimately a Russian soldier. And then, by the way, from what I understand, Russian soldiers can't have phones on them. They're not recording. You'll see these videos of people recording dead people or getting shot. Who's doing that? The Russian soldiers are not supposed to have any phones on them. When I went to Iraq as a U.S. Marine, I didn't have a phone on me. I didn't have a cell phone. I could just call anyone I want, record videos. So who does, though? Oh, the Ukrainians do, because they're always recording everything. They're always making yeah. videos, sharing it on Telegram. So it's very strange. So we have to question a narrative, no matter what side you're on or if you're not on any side, because I'm neutral, really. I really care about the Ukrainian people. I don't think they're going to make it. I yeah. don't think they can win this. Yeah. That's why I'm appealing to them. And listen, stop this, guys. you got to sit down and have peace talks. Yeah. They'll say, well, we can't trust Putin. He'll go back in his word. Okay, if that's the case, have a peace talk. And then we show the world he'll lie. But they won't do it because I don't think he would go back on his word. You see? Yeah. So this is the situation we're in right now, is that the Western media has not only pumped up the Ukrainians with the delusional suicidal fantasy that they're going to win somehow, but also the Europeans are like, oh, we have to suffer together to support this war, to stop fascism or whatever the case. <laughs> when, yeah. the, when the Russians were, were the most critical force against the Nazis. I mean, has everyone forgotten how the Russians came? They lost tens of millions of people to fight fascism and Nazis, and suddenly now they're fascists. I mean, yeah. You know, by the way, everyone's a fascist now, right? Everyone gets called, no one even knows what the word means. So it's just another pejorative people throw around. Like, it's like, it means bully, but that's what, that's what it really means right now. Nobody knows what it is, but, oh, you're a fascist and you're a Nazi and you're a racist and you're a bigot. It's another word that people use to shut down people, label them, and, and just make the, the holier-than-thou narrative. Like, I'm morally superior to you because I support Ukraine and you don't because you're a fascist. I'm calling for peace and I'm getting death threats. I mean, is that, does that make sense? <laughs> does it make any sense? Yeah. yeah. So Let, let's, uh, let's talk about it. I'd, I'd like to talk about your, the, the kind of, you've gone sort of full circle. You were 
yourself sent to twice to Iraq. So you fought yeah. in that war. You were actively a participant in that war. Tell me the story uh, of Lucas. What changed for you? At what point was it during the Iraq war or after the Iraq war that it, the penny started dropping to you that this whole thing about Saddam Hussein and weapons of mass destruction is just one massive lie? Tell me more about that. Yeah, that was after the war. So during the war, we had no idea. None of us knew. My first tour was the invasion. So I was a, I was 8th Engineer Support Battalion. So yeah. we were engin combat engineers who supported the infantry who were in the front lines. We would build bridges that were, you know, if there was a bridge that was destroyed, we would build a bridge, a, mer a medium girder bridge to go over it. IRBs in the water, we'd connect them to go over rivers, things like that. But as a Marine, you're a rifleman. So convoy security, you know, all sorts of different things, mine sweeping, et cetera. What age? Uh, Luke? I was 18 when I first went in. So I thought I was old. Rambo. I was and, I, and, I guess, and yeah. I guess you were pumped up by believing oh, yeah, oh, yeah. the message thought, that you heard yeah. and you were out there to fight for your country. You were a patriot. Right. Were and I truly believed we were there to liberate the people. Mm -hmm. So when we came in, I was all proud. Like, yeah, I'm helping these Iraqi people. And they were very nice people. I mean, they didn't know what was going on either, probably. Uh, you know, children wanted food. We'd give them food. You know, they were friendly. But they had no idea, and they had no choice either. What are you going to do something to us? What are you going to throw a rock at us? You know. So, but yeah, these people were devastated, completely annihilated. Their military wiped out very quickly. So my first tour was the invasion itself. We were behind uh, infantry. The second tour, however, was maintaining everything we gained. So I was stationed at Al Assad Air Base, and that's where all the burn pits are. By the way, people get sick from them, and also when the uh, Iranians retaliated. Uh, remember when Trump assassinated Soleimani? They retaliated hitting Al-Assad Air Base. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, that's years later, but that's where I was stationed, yeah. uh, my second tour, which by at that point, we had a gym 24 hours. We had steak and lobster on Sunday. It's like living somewhere, you know, pretty nice there. Um, and we would go out and do missions. At that point, we were doing uh, get rid of explosive, uh, unexposed, unexploded ordnance. So we'd find uh, – mines we'd find uh artillery shells that would be used for ieds we'd blow them up get rid of them stuff like that mine sweeping missions so it was maintaining what we gained making sure everything's safe and again at that again none of us knew the truth about anything you know we didn't know what was going on we did see trucks of oil, oil trucks just going back and forth taking oil we did see black water driving around their four by four nissans with their yeah. beards and backwards nike hats and glad doing whatever they want who knows who they're killing we don't know what's going on and they're making 120000 a year. I mean, I'm making nothing. He's doing the same thing I'm doing, but worse, and making more money. Yeah. So there's a lot of special interests there. So we noticed that. And a lot of downtime. I mean, a lot of things, we didn't really do much there, you know? Yeah. Uh, so... I'd like but, to ask you, though, whether you did see, you know, we talk about the death and destruction of... Yes. The oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The first tour, for sure. Let, let the first ask, tour. What, does it, what does that do to the mind of an 18-year-old? Well, again, I thought it was John Rambo. But uh, when you start seeing people die, for example, the one that I saw directly in front of me was uh, I was at the our mission was to build a medium girder bridge over Saddam Canal. And so the canal was destroyed. The bridges were destroyed. And we had an AV uh, amphibious vehicle in front of us. And boom, this got hit. So five Marines in there, three of them died, two of them injured. I can still hear the screams there. So that's in front of me as an 18 year old. And I'm being told by a master gunner, don't fire across the river. So I'm on, I'm on the 240 gun because yeah, we do everything as Marines. So that was convoy security. Don't fire because the Marines over there are firing at these people over there, over the bridge, over the river. So I was in combat. I have a combat action ribbon. I was in combat zones, but I myself did not engage in yeah. combat yeah. myself. So I wasn't shooting people. I wasn't, but indirect mortar fire, like these guys in front of us. Uh, there was one time there was a sniper trying to kill me and my friend. But he was shooting us with an AK-47 for like over a thousand. It wasn't. There was no way he could hit us. So the bullets were like, "What is that?" With all these like noises, what is that? And my one of the master sergeants, he had a sniper rifle. He's like, "Oh, there's a guy in the there's a guy in the one of those uh, buildings over there taking pop shots at us. I don't know why, but he is. So they're harassing us. However, there was a time where my Humvee, I was on a Humvee again, on 240 gunner. My friends with me were driving up the highway. All of a sudden, pop! We see this thing pop up. I'm like, what the hell was that? So we just kept going. We're like, whoa, what was that? When the EOD went back there, okay, EOD is the explosive guys. They said, yeah. you know, there was a, 
IED, man, it, it misfired. So that could have killed me and my friends. Mm-hmm. So me and my buddies, we actually talked about it yesterday when I spoke about the show I did with Redacted. I said, my buddy Young Yam, I said, yeah, I mentioned the IED. So yeah, I remember that. So it, it's incredible. I, I, I could have died for nothing. We all would have been dead because I was on a Humvee. It wasn't like on a big truck, a seven ton. So that, these are the things I noticed, by the way, also just the devastation of the cities. You know, you drive into a town, everything's destroyed, broken glass, rubble everywhere, people walking around white flags so they don't get shot, so they know they're not enemy combatants. Because there are times where there are people who are insurgents, but that was more prevalent the second tour. But the first tour, these were civilians, so they were just white flag, they don't want to be shot. But I've seen dead people on the side of the road. Who knows what they if, why are these people dead? One would look like a teenager. Another guy was dead by the bridge, yeah. shot in the head. What did he do? You know, he was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, yeah. but the devastation of the military that we have is so awesome. And I, I don't mean that in a good way, but the power that it has, incredible power of our weaponry, our air force. Yeah. It's just, it's, they had no, the Iraqis had no chance at all. They would surrender in battalions. They, we had stories where a tank commander just gave up. He's like, I quit. <laughs> just take all his people and yeah. take them away. And, and unfortunately, I did see the tortures we did. For example, putting, you know, you know how the, uh, you would see people. This was under, under rape you're talking about? Yeah, like th- that kind of technique, bag on the head, yeah. putting them in awkward positions for multiple hours yeah. a day. Yeah. Yeah. We would drive past those kind of camps, you know. One of my buddies did security for them. And he's like, yeah, it's terrible what they're doing to these people. Who are these people? I have no idea. They could have been regular people that could be bad. Who knows? But yeah, I've seen this stuff. And I said, this is horrific. I wouldn't wish this upon anybody. Yeah. So my near-death experience itself was what it does to your brain, hypervigilance, PTSD. You're always looking out for problems. You know, yeah. Even when I go to a restaurant with my family, I'm always looking at the door just in case some guy comes in with a machine gun. Is that normal? Absolutely not. But that's the way I, I was in the situation. That's the worst part of it all. Yeah. You know, my, my biggest fear was getting not killed, maimed, yeah. getting shot in the face or something, getting burned by an IED. That was my biggest fear. So I had hypervigilance and this anxiety that I have to this day because I do have PTSD. Yeah. That's what ruins your mind mostly yeah. for I, I want to ask you a question that might sound terribly naive i've never sure. been i i have only seen the 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 result of war i've, I've never seen yeah. conflict in in my entire life I, i'm trying to find a sort of an image of myself you're a you know a young kid 18 19 years old you really know little about the world does the machine the military machine while you are there and you're experiencing all this devastation and human misery around you does it keep you pumped up psychologically with your mission what your mission is supposed to be all about do you guys talk to one another and say to one another sometimes what the hell are we doing here well it desensitizes you very much mm-hmm. like there was a time where I, I we were sleeping by an artillery battery so it's like a bunch of artillery guns just lined up and we we, we didn't even know we were there all of a sudden boom boom boom, boom it was 5 a.m boom 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 boom, boom. And you just see the shell, the bullet go out to Baghdad. And we're like, wow, look at this power. And a- as you start getting used to these sounds, explosions and firefights, you just become desensitized. So you're so the 18-year-old that went into the Marine Corps or at 17th late entry program, once I got to boot camp, that that already traumatizes you. That already takes you away from civilian life, breaks you down to a unit, to a robot. And then you go into the war zone, and that really so when you start seeing death in this, you're just like, ah, you know, whatever. It doesn't bother you anymore. But the first, uh, the first time you witness a dead body, the first time you see the devastation, it is shocking. But then you get used to it. You're like, all right, well, I guess we're going back out. Get your guns ready, guys. You know that's how it was. But a young mind, eighteen, yeah. has no concept. And then there you are. And then when you get out of the Marine Corps, good luck. You're 22 now. Good luck with your life. Go adapt. And uh, that doesn't work for most people. Yeah, Lucas, as I just said to you, you know, you know, I could have been your grandfather and to be very, very honest, to listen to you, just to listen to you. And I've not had the opportunity to talk to, to talk to American soldiers, American Marines before in my life. It really touches me. It really kind of causes a, a pain in my own heart to listen to you. Um, I, I want to ask you that question again. Uh, uh, you become desensitized. Uh, yeah. The horror upon all horrors is, in fact, when you return back to your country and people tell you, that you've actually fought the wrong war. What happens? Mm. Well, first, most people say thank you for your service, and you're like, yeah, yeah, you're welcome, you know. Uh, but 
when you learn about the truth that the war was based on lies, I would assume it's similar to when the people who came back from Vietnam, but they came back, people spitting on them, calling them baby killers. That was way worse than what we experienced, yeah. Yeah. but we probably felt the same. And, you know, my research into the war, when you asked me earlier, what did I, when did I snap out of it was after the war, during the final year of my Marine Corps, I was a MIMS clerk. MIMS clerks are people who uh, do inventory. So atheist be inventory, how many boats do we have? How much medium girder bridges? How many supplies and everything? So I was doing the inventory there. So I had access to the internet and I started doing research about Fallujah and all the toughest battles we had. And I noticed that we were using incendiary. So white phosphorus, the drop it on people. But to me, that's a chemical weapon. Yeah. Apparently it's not a some technicality but it burns people a lot it makes you into a black skeleton so i'm looking at these black skeletons and i'm like how are we the good guys dropping this stuff on iraqis you know and then the other things came out with snowden and stuff so over the years i realized i was lied to and that's even more devastating than the war itself in a sense because then you know you did it for absolutely nothing so it's not like the iraqis attacked america and we're fighting for our freedom we're under attack you know no we are fighting we are the bad guys and the iraqis were the, trying to defend themselves from us invading their homelands. They're the freedom fighters, not us. And I only thank God I didn't kill anyone during my service. That's I could say that proudly. People say, how many did you kill? Some people get mad at me. I said, I killed nobody. And no one in my platoon died, thank God. Those Marines in front of me who died, they weren't in my platoon or my unit. But not, no one I knew personally died when I went to Iraq those two times. However, the third tour my unit went on, I was getting out. One of the guys did die. He was 19. He had two kids. So that's sad. So as you say that you sit there and you say you feel bad. Uh, yes. You know, it's it's a tragedy that one young guys, 18 years old, they don't even know what's going on in life, are in these situations. And two, when they come back home after your four years of service, or I did four years, you could do longer. Go back, see how you see you fit into society. You don't. You don't fit in society. You know, I tried many times to do community college, right? I did very well my first time. Then I dropped out. Did the same classes again. They forgave my withdrawals because of my PTSD. Same teacher. You're back again. Yeah, it's me. I'm going to do it again. Dropped out again. I tried several types of work. Couldn't finish the work. Couldn't, couldn't stick to it because I wanted that high of, you know, that feeling of hypervigilance. And I was bored easily. I was depressed constantly, you know, I was at one time, my friend handed me a job. He said, look, you don't have to show up at the office. Just get contracts for energy consulting and fax them to me. Go ahead. And I can make all this literally no, no cap on how much money I could. I could have been a millionaire. Problem is you have to be self-motivated to be a salesman. You have to be able to get up in the morning and you push yourself, but you can't do that. If you're depressed one minute, then manic the other and sad and then angry. And so that's how the war affects you when you leave and try to go back into society. You don't fit in because you're damaged. I didn't even know I had PTSD until these things manifested. The quitting of things, the unable to maintain a job, my relationships with people, disastrous, toxic, you know, just being with people. I was introverted even worse than I am at the time. I was so introverted. I, I didn't even want to talk to people. A numbness of humanity. So the real tragedy is the war. But then what happens to you after the war? And imagine Vietnam. When these guys came back. They had no idea they had PTSD. Yeah. They, they call it shell shock. But what treatment did they get? Guys getting Agent Orange. So all these other problems they deal with. Just suck it up, man. No, you can't just suck it up. Yeah. So now even the guys from Vietnam are getting treated properly. Finally, after decades doing the research on the traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder. But we uh, came back and they were already you know, telling us, go to the VA claim your benefits. I'm like, why? I'm, I'm okay. But I wasn't okay. And you don't even realize it until you start running into these problems. So that's the real tragedy. And that's why war has to be prevented. That's why I'm pushing for peace. I don't want war on anybody. I want the Ukrainians and the Russians to find peace. I'm not picking one side. I'm not saying Russia, take everything or Ukraine, Slava Ukraine. I'm saying stop because this is what's going to happen to your people. You know, the only difference peace talks right now and next year is how many people die. Yeah, that's yeah. the difference. So why would you wait? Just do it now. But these people have this suicidal narrative driven into their heads. You're going to win. You're going to destroy Putin. You're going to you're not. And let's be honest about it. It's going to be very painful to see Ukraine be just destroyed. Yeah. It's that Putin will not allow it. 
yeah. to sit there as a threat to Russia. He can't. He can't. So it's a tragedy that it's even began. So we have to push for peace now. And like you said, it is, it's hard to listen to people who, and look, I'm physically okay. It's not like I lost my legs. It's not like, you know, there are guys who got burned alive and yeah. they have no face. I've seen this, you know, it's, that's heartbreaking too. So it, we have to prevent war because it's the worst thing mankind does to itself. Yeah. The worst thing. Yeah, and, and I want to I want to I want to ask you this, Lucas. It's it's, it's uh, you know clearly you you're very passionate about it, and I yeah. can understand that you've you've gone through a traumatic experience in your in your in your uh, life as well. Is is part of your drive a, a feeling of not necessarily only the terrible things you experienced and saw in war, but the fact that you feel and you've stated, and I'm suggesting with you that all of this could have been avoided and that you've been lied to by your own government is is how strong a motivating force is that in what you're now doing calling for an end to this war and trying to bring understanding to the why the reasons behind this war is this and i tell you why i say that why i ask you this question and of course we have perhaps in lots of ways different perspectives on the world and view the, the world from different angles but I, uh, angles but i remember in the time of uh, the, the moment when uh, Colin Powell, for example, sat at the United Nations mm. and did his little lab thing and so on, that we all knew it was a lie. Yeah. We all knew it was a lie. Um, and that we kind of also felt that the leaders that were lying to us knew that they were lying to us. That told, is that the anger that, that, that gets to you? Is that it's so in your face and that they know that they're lying to you? Well, yeah, it's that. And it's also the fact that I know that the tragic outcomes of these things. I don't, I, yeah, I don't want to wish it on anyone. I, and it can be prevented. It can be prevented just by talking. I honestly believe the activism we did for Syria prevented how how worse it could have been. We, mm -hmm. Assad is still there in power because so many people were like, this chemical weapons attack was not Assad. Mm -hmm. Look at the reports. They're, 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 not, they're not reliable. Look what happened here. Look at these white helmets. Very suspicious. Thank God for the internet. You see, back in 2002, it wasn't that big. Not everyone was doing things on the internet, you know. Now it's everyone. Everyone's got a phone. Everyone can record things and be like, hey, I'm in the area. Nothing's going on. What are you talking about, CNN? You know, I'm right here. There's no attack. There's no. So there's like everyone can become a journalist now and share information in, in seconds online and post something, you know. Yeah. So that counteracts the narrative. Like we have the ghost of Kiev. Total nonsense. Total nonsense. But if it was, you know, during the 40s, how would you debunk that with the newspaper? You can't. But now you have cameras, you have different people in the area. What are you talking about goes to Kiev? What are you talking about this massacre? What are you talking about? So now we have things, basically, we have eyes everywhere. And with these eyes, we can debunk the lies. So one of my, the main driver for me is justice. So I was lied to. You know, I had to go through all this crap. Other people worse than me. Also, the Iraqis, millions dead. Devastated nation. You know, we see what's going on in Yemen. We see what's going on. What happened to Gaddafi in Libya? We see what's going on everywhere. And it has to end. And, and the only way it can end is if we, the people, say no more and do something about it. Yeah. And that takes uh, courage and takes people to get off their ass and stop being complacent. Because like you said, people know they're lying to us. Here's a guy saying there's anthrax in here. He has anthrax in a vial. In Are you serious? You know, and, and we're sitting there like he's full of it. Yeah. But who's... Who was held accountable after the Iraq war? No one. Did anyone go to jail? Did Bush, Cheney? Did, no, nothing. Because the people aren't the... But the people are also swamped by their own problems with the media makes up. You know, wage gap problem or gender this or this. There's so many attacks. The, 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 the monstrous machine attacks the people in so many ways they can't even handle the truth. Yeah. Even, yeah. And they know it. They go, well, I can't stop these people. They're crazy. Oh, well, I got to pay my mortgage. Look what's happening to our fuel sources. What's going on with... Gas is like fifty dollars a gallon. You know, per you know, people have so many problems that they 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 would love to stop these things, but they're so overwhelmed. I think by yeah. uh, design, where they just don't have it in them to fight. They're fighting for their the next meal on their table. But they're not going to fight this grand thing yeah. about you know stopping the war machine. Yeah. But the passion comes from the sense of justice. That that's what I want. I want to see these people brought to justice, and I want these wars to stop because they don't need to happen. They don't need to happen. They could all end right now. I mean, and by the way, how do they end peace talks? It's always yeah. 
peace talks. That's why I said let's skip the killing and go right to peace talks. Well, yeah. wait. Yeah. If I have to, if I if I go and, and and sort of measure the temperature of other war veterans like like yourself, your mates, people who had gone through this, would they echo what you say by and large, or would yours be a minority view? No, everyone I served with understands what I've said to be true. Everyone agrees. So all my buddies, like I posted the video of Redacted. They all watch it. They go, yeah, well, this is 100% I agree with you. Are they as passionate as me? No, they're not. Mm -hmm. Because they either work or something like this, or they, they don't have the ability to speak like I do. And it's just not their it's not their nature, if you will. So most people agree with me. I mean, my my interview from Redacted was like 99% positive. Thousands of comments. He's the hero. He's he's great. This guy's telling the truth. You know all that stuff, and that's great to hear. But we need more than that. We need more than just praising a person and clicking like. We need people to, you know, get out there and, and run for office and oppose the war directly. You know, I mean, protests like it so far. I, I don't. When the, I think a protest is good to bring awareness, but these people, the elites, they look at the protest. They go, look at these stupid cattle. You think we're going to do what they say? They just ignore it. Yeah. You know, it's like protesting Pfizer. They don't give a damn. They're going to just tell your congressman, give immunity. They don't give a damn. Yeah. So we have to do more than just uh, protest and like videos. And But the, the awareness has to get to a certain point. So that so that it is good to share, you know, programs like yourself and others out there doing this. That is important. But that's not only it. You can't just say, oh, I shared a video and I'm done. You have to educate everyone in your family, wake everyone else that you can up and do your part. Everyone's got to do their part. At least know the truth. And then from there, a movement can arise to take out the the problems that are causing this, but yeah. it's got to be more than just sitting down and agreeing with me. You see? Yeah. yeah. If you, if you sit around the table, just with family now, and not talking about people who are active, because mm -hmm. I think that you, a, a lot of your power comes in, in communicating what you're communicating comes actually from the fact that you've been there. Yes. You've seen the horrors of war. So you really, you know what you're talking about. And I think, it, and, and you felt lied to, but if you talk to the average American and you say to them, well, it's, Let's skip Vietnam out of this. Just look at the uh, the fact that America has been involved in something like 200 military interventions yeah. since 1985. We look at the disaster of the Iraqi war, probably a million people killed in that war, millions yeah. of lives disrupted. We look at the, the destruction of Libya, and we hear your secretary um, of state then, Hillary Clinton, having a bit of a giggle about the fact that we came we saw and we killed this man yeah what do i does the is, is there not is there not some kind of a isn't there a point where the american citizen the ordinary man sort of sees the clarity that you've mentioned before it's the same old playbook we see it over and over playing itself out that there is a point where there will be really a massive resistance it's from ordinary people well, the problem with the United States is it's so diverse in the sense that so many people oppose each other to unite against one thing is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. For example, you have a president who's anti-war. They hate him, so they're not going to be anti-war. It's so it's so childish. Mm -hmm. So the United States is divided in every possible ism, every ideology, gender. They, every, so people, even if, let's suppose I agree with the guy. Well, are you for this feminism? No, I don't agree with Oh, I can't tell. I can't be your friend. Yeah, I'm not going to help you now. So, like, that's the problem with the United. It's so divided. There's too much diversity. I'm not saying diversity is bad, but when it's so much where there's not even an ideological idea where it's on the same page, then you have a problem. So, you can see people agreeing that war is bad. There is war fatigue. I, I, I think Americans are just tired of paying for war. That's more of a selfish thing than a justified thing. Like, we shouldn't be in any war anyway. But they're sick of the taxes going up. When they see another 50 billion, another 80 billion, like, wait a minute, I need that. I need it for my children. I, I can't, I'm getting $600 for COVID relief. This guy's getting, you know, billions over here. What the hell's going on? So they're, they're seeing it financially. That's the only way Americans are unified. It's economics, right? It's their wallets, unfortunately, because again, we're so diverse here, religiously, racially, ethnically, you, you pick it. Nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, where's, where can we unify yeah. You could be anti-war, but how do we stop this war? Oh, I have this idea, that idea. And you see even the people who are supposed to be anti-war are for the war. Ilhan Omar or AOC should be against, but they're pushing for it. It's incredible what's happening. In fact, 
the woke crowd, right? The people who are supposed to be like diversity, love, and every love always wins. They're the ones pushing this war more than anybody. And the Republicans are against it. You know, it's it's very strange how it just did a 180 in this country. It flipped over to the other side. It's not even that it's like the neocons and the woke crowd together are pushing this Ukraine war because they're saying Ukraine has the same values as us. They value LGBTQA. They value democracy. That meanwhile, there's Nazis there. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, you know. And you got Chuck Schumer, who's a Jewish guy supporting Nazis. It's like the most clown world thing you've ever seen. And that's really what's strange about this country. So again, so much diversity. And the, I think the, the the elite know that they understand. The more you divide people on every line, but there's no unity. It's impossible. Yeah. If this was America, in the 1950s, it'd be a lot different. You know, but it's so different now that's like, how can you get anyone to agree on anything? Yeah. Especially when one half of the country hates the other half. One half thinks they're fascists, the other thinks they're communists. How are they gonna get along? You know? So that's what they do. I mean, if you look at Occupy Wall Street, everyone was there. Every type of person doesn't matter what they believe religiously, ideologically. Stop the Wall Street criminals. What did the media do? Oh, let's go back to identity politics. Let's talk about gender wage gaps and discrimination of blacks and suddenly everyone got distracted again so that's what they do with the domestic policies they start you know guns or no guns vaccine no vaccine mask no mask distracting the people so that the war is just out there well it's nothing to do with me at least i'm not getting bombed but they are paying for it and they're sick of seeing that there's no money for things they need here so that's unfortunately the americans think it needs to be in my pocket that's sad. Rather than I, I don't want to kill people. It's I want my money back. That's that's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. I am saying I don't want anyone to die, and we shouldn't pay for it. You know, if these people want to duke it out on their own, that's their problem. You know, right? You can think like that. But most Americans are just economically upset, if you want to call it that. Yeah, uh, we're going to have to to start closing down here. Um, uh, one, uh, I just want to get your reaction to, I heard and read the other day, not too long ago, that uh, the very, in the, at least in the in the world out here, the very famous David Petrias, General David Petrias, called Petrias, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name correct now. Petrias, I think. Petrias. Yeah. Um, sort of called for boots on the ground with a sort of a coalition of the willing. Uh, do you think that that... And I go back to what I said before, same old playbook, same old playbook. Is there a real chance that that would happen, that it would escalate to that, that in, in your estimation, if you talk to your well, friends? Well, we already have, same? we already have 4,700 airmen over there, Air, 101 Airborne, I believe it is, uh, 101st Airborne, so 4,700 mm -hmm. waiting to see what, the, we're here to support Ukraine, just we're ready to fight overnight, the guy said. Okay, what happens if one guy gets killed? Two guys, five, ten. What happens? Well, America, now you're going to tell, hey, we're getting killed over there. Americans are dying. We shouldn't be there at all. So when they, they said no boots on the ground at all, now they're sending boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. And they're now the coalition of the willing, so it's not NATO. See? Oh, it's just a bunch of volunteers doing it, mercenaries, whoever else. Anything's possible. But here's my point. The more Americans are there, the more countries that join, whether it be Poland and Italy, well, Italy, I think, is going to pull out of this, but We'll see. The more nations, the more of a world war it becomes, the closer it gets to nuclear war and threats to all of us. So this has to be stopped. I mean, like I said, we have to keep pushing the truth out there, talking sense to people. And hopefully we could do what we did with Syria and make this conflict come to an end sooner than later. That's the only hope we have right now. But I, I don't think it could last forever because there's only so many resources that we can give the Ukrainians. Europeans are not going to like this winter. Then the next winter, they're not going to like the gas prices. The Americans aren't going to like the diesel prices, especially if diesel runs out. How long can these people support this war that's not even affecting them personally? That's another thing. It's it's not even, we're not feeling the effects only, we're only feeling the effects because of the sanctions we put on Russia, which are helping Russia get closer to China, which is getting closer to the BRICS. And now the Saudis are leaving the petrodollar. So if you wanted to destroy America, this is exactly what you should do. So you see what's happening here. People are going to get sick of this. They're going to say, wait a minute. So again, I tell people, let's let's be honest. Let's be honest. You can, cannot win this war. We need to convince them to, to have the peace talks. No matter how much they don't like this, it's better now than later. That's all I can say about it, you know? Yeah. I want to close with a, a more personal question, if you don't yeah. mind, Lucas. 
Um, I am I'm sure that what you've experienced was 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 tough. I think there are loads and loads of other young men who had gone through darker moments as well. My question to you is, and, and it's in reference to the fact that thousands of people are being killed at the moment as we're speaking. Uh, the country's infrastructure is being destroyed as we're speaking right now. There's still no end to this war. Just as an ex-Marine, a soldier, does the pain of the war and the experience of it, do you think, ever go away? No. I still have dreams that I'm in the military. When I'm late for formation or I'm at war. It's incredible. It's it's subconscious. It's in your animal reptilian brain. Whatever the deepest brain we have, it's stuck there because it's a survival mechanism. So I know, and I again, I didn't even see the worst of it. I had a friend, recon sniper, almost killed himself. My friend Rocco, good guy. I, I kept close to him. And I told him, don't ever put the, don't ever do that again, Rocco. Gave his guns away to his uncle, took him away from him. Because he almost killed him because he was a sniper. He did kill people. That's why I say, thank God I don't kill anyone. Because if I knew I was in a war, that was for lies and I killed children, I would kill myself, probably, maybe not. But the point is, I would have thought of it and probably like my friend Rocco put a gun to his mouth and maybe have killed myself. So I think my I thank God I didn't do that. But I know Marines who have killed themselves, unfortunately. Right. I have, I have a lot of friends who died after the war, forgot to mention that, who did take their lives for whatever reason. They couldn't fit in, they felt depressed. It's that every day 22 people commit suicide, every ser the servicemen. So that doesn't go away. The PTSD doesn't go away. I take medication for it, but there are times where it can't solve every thought or problem. It can't stop my dreams. So, and my, and my friend Rocco told me he still sees people at the end of his bed that he kills. Imagine that he wakes up, there's a 14 year old kid that he shot at his bed. He's, he's delusional, he's, he's hallucinating, whatever it is, that's the trauma. So this could happen to the Ukrainian people. This could happen to the Russian soldiers fighting the Ukrainians. This is a tragedy that we all can experience, and I don't wish it upon anybody. And that's why I say we have to push for peace because it's only going to get worse. It, can, it it won't get any better, and more of these things will happen. More soldiers will be injured, more civilian infrastructure, more civilians will be killed on both sides. This is why it's the tragedy. And, you know, I told uh, Clayton the same thing. Once the war is started, it's it's already a disaster, right? It doesn't matter what the reason is doesn't matter who's lying. Once you're in the combat zone, it's either you or that guy over there. You both have families, but only one of you can go home. And that's the, that's the real tragedy of war. And that's why we have to prevent it as much as we can. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's not something that goes away. Even me, like I said, my friend was a recon sniper. Okay. That's hardcore Marine right there. Didn't go through what he went through. His friend blew up and literally in pieces collecting his friend, wake up, Bill, wake up. <laughs> Like some crazy movie, right? I didn't go through that. <laughs> but I can imagine how it's like. And I wouldn't want that to be something I did go through. Thank God I didn't. But in even me not going through that and just seeing things like that, yeah. it, it's already devastating. So imagine that personal friend blowing up in your arms. This is the worst thing that humans do to themselves. That's why it's something that you know we have to stand. And I, I appreciate you having me on to discuss this because this is crucial for humanity to overcome this ego driven need to hurt each other. It's so insane. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Jason, we've got one minute left. Um, the, the, the two, two messages I get out of our discussion here, a, a great deal of empathy and, and really pain to, to listen to your experiences. And I, can imagine how much of it is out there. Uh, it might even be reflected in, I see that the US military is finding it more and more difficult to actually recruit people as well. I think all of these things do have effects as perpetual kind of war. Um, there's two messages that, you, that you're giving me. The one is a peace message, obviously, but the other one, and I want to get your confirmation on this, is also you are trying to say to Americans or to people who are only focused on the mainstream media, I would imagine something like there they will only be peace if we actually truly understand the roots of the evil, the reasons for this war, which would be that we are compelled to, at the end of the day, also listen to the other side of the story. Am I saying that correctly or am I feeding, putting words in your mouth now? No, you're saying it correctly. You have to do your due diligence. You can't just accept the narrative blindly and think that's patriotism. Patriotism isn't someone who blindly, a patriot is not a person who just blindly 
uh, obeys their government. A patriot is someone who protects their people from a government that's abusing them. And I think when your government's lying to you, sending people in harm's way, that's abusive, isn't it? Using your tax dollars to kill people across the world, very abusive, very tyrannical, very evil. So a patriot is someone who defends their people from their government when they start abusing the people that they care about. That's what a patriot is. So I'm trying to, so don't think you're patriotic, just supporting the flag and America's the greatest country ever lived. No, we've done wrong. We've been, listen, we've been around for what, 247 years. We've been at war for like 200 plus years. 96% of our existence has been war or funding war. No wonder why everyone calls us the great Satan. There's a reason why they say these things. Not because they're making it up. It's because we are one of the most dangerous empires, perhaps the dangerous empire that's ever existed in the, in the, in human history. And we have to reflect. It's about self-reflection, learning the truth to say, you know what, we're the bad guys. And you know what's good about this? We can stop being the bad guys once we know the truth. So that's another thing about doing the research, saying, wow, we're the ones who are doing wrong. If I didn't research Fallujah, if I didn't go through the rabbit holes that I went through, I wouldn't be here today talking like this. I'd be like, no, America's great. You know, Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. He just moved them to Egypt or something, some other stupid narrative. It's because I had self-reflection, because I didn't have the arrogance of American exceptionalism. And I was able to reflect, even though I was, a, you would think of the last person would be someone who was in the situation to admit it. I'm the first person to admit it. Something was wrong and looked into it. My identity was based on this uniform. I'm a Marine, a few of the proud. The, that's what they do. They, they program you to be proud of this stuff. So you don't question it, but I questioned it. And that's what makes me, I guess, honorable among the, the viewers, people who see these videos of mine. He's a true hero because I went against the programming and said, I'm the bad guy and I'm going to stop being the bad guy and I'm going to show others that they can stop being the bad guy too so we can start being the good guys and fix the problems that our government has created across the world. So that's the real message here is to self-reflect. Don't just eat up America's exceptionalism, the greatest country ever lived. Nah, we've done a lot of bad stuff and we need to stop. And the only way we could do that is if we Stop it ourselves. Lucas Gage, I want to thank you for really your courage to speak out. And I think that you add an incredibly valuable part to this discourse. Um, I wish you well, my friend. Thank you very much. It's been a fantastic experience to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. The pleasure is mine. Don't fall for the lies. If you truly care about the Ukrainians and the Russians, especially the civilians, you want to talk peace right now. Let's push for peace not for war.